Hello and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhat. In this session, we would look at CPE exam questions that deal specifically with audit sampling. This topic is covered obviously on the auditing section of the CPA exam as well as in an auditing course. This topic gives students a lot of headaches. One, it's maybe they don't have a good statistical background, they don't like the math part of it, or they don't simply they don't understand it, or the teacher doesn't do a good job explaining it. So I hope through these questions I can sh shed some lights. But if you want more explanations, in detailed explanation, introductory explanation about this topic, I strongly suggest you check out my website, my auditing and attestation course. I have over 160 lessons which is four or five lessons that deal with this audit sampling. As always, I would like to remind you to connect with me on LinkedIn if you haven't done so. YouTube is where you would need to subscribe. I have 1,700 plus accounting, auditing, tax, finance, as well as Excel tutorial. If you like my lessons, if you like my lectures, please like them, share them, put them in playlists. If they benefit you, it means they might benefit other people as well. Share the wealth, subscribe, and connect with me on Instagram. As I just stated on my website, farhatlectures.com, I do have a full-pledged auditing course that will help you with this topic as well as many other topics, but specifically with sampling. And I can assure you, my sampling lessons are very, very good. So I strongly suggest you check it out if you really want to learn it. Okay, and don't shortchange yourself. I can help you add 10 to 15 points to your CPA exam. Check out my website. So what I will be doing is looking at, you know, few questions. Um, and those questions are important. I would not say they're basics. You have to understand sampling. You have to understand audit sampling. You, you cannot walk into the exam, the audit section, without really have a good understanding because they can pose, po pose the questions in so many different ways. You have to have a good understanding of it. Let's go ahead and get started to see how much we know, how much we don't know, then take it from there. An auditor is sampling for attributes. As soon as you hear the word attribute, it means they're sampling for the internal control. That's good. Which of the following is correct regarding the sample size when the auditor determined that the expected rate is different from the originally expected? So when we when we when we sample for attribute, what, what is sampling for attribute? For example, we want to make sure that all the checks are signed by an authorized person. If all the checks are signed by an authorized person, it means the internal control are good. All what we're looking for is attributes. Are they signed? by the authorized person yes or no attribute so before we start to check the checks whether they are properly uh, the, the the person that's that signed them is properly authorized we we set an expectation error rate we think for example there's a chance that two percent are not signed we expect that the two percent of the checks are not signed then we're going to go ahead and select a sample of checks then we find out it's either one percent or 5%. So something other than the originally expected. We The expected was 2%. We expect a 2%, but eventually we're going to find out whether it's 2, 1, or 5. So what happened when we have that deviation? What happened at the sample side? Let's see. If the expected rate has risen, the sample size would reduce. Well, if we increase our expected error rate, we started with 2, and now we think we're going to have more. In other words, we're going to have, might have three. Now we're going to, we're increasing our expected rate. What do we do? Do we reduce the sample size? And the answer is no. If we, if we expect to have more deviation, in other words, more people signing the checks who are not authorized, we're going to increase the sample size. And the reason is because we have more risk. We have to select more because the internal control are not working as we expected. So A is out. B. If the expected error rate has fallen, now we thought it's two, but guess what? I think it's it's one. Now we're looking at it, it's really one. The sample size will increase? No, the sample size will go down. If we, if we think it was 2% and now we, we're finding out it should be 1% or even 0%, all the checks are properly signed, then we should not increase the sample size because the sample size means we have to do more work. If we can rely on their control, that's that's the reason we test the control is to rely or not to rely. If we think we can rely, we reduce the sample size, so B is out. So if A and B are out, I can take out D immediately. If the expected rate has risen, obviously C must be the answer, the sample size will be increased, and the answer is yes. If, the, if I find out the expected rate should be higher than 2%, now I started to look at these things, then guess what? 
to compensate, I have to increase my sample size. Therefore, the answer is C. Let's take a look at this question. The sample rate of deviation plus the allowance sampling risk equal to what? So basically here they're asking you, do you know even the basic terminology that we that we use? And this is it's very important to understand the basic terminology. So what is the sample rate of deviation here? We're looking at the deviation rate. It's a percentage. So we pulled 50, 100 checks and we're looking, let's let's look with the, let's work with the same example. So we pulled 100 checks and let's let's assume we're looking for the signature. The authorized people are they are the authorized people signing those checks and we find out four 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 were not did not sign the check so four out of 100 is four percent so the sample notice the sample rate of deviation is four percent so from this sample we have a deviation of four percent but remember this is only a sample so what does that mean think of when we have those uh, polls for politicians the president's approval rate they would say the president's approval rate is 39 percent plus or minus two percent so it could be 37 it could be 41 because we sampled same thing with the when we sample when we sample for the internal control because we sampled there could be more issues more problems so we have what we add we add to the sampling deviation rate and allowance risk and let's assume the allowance risk is three percent so what is this sampling deviation rate three percent plus the allowance for sampling risk so the allowance is basically we're saying since we are sampling there's always the risk of we did not collect the proper sampling size or the sampling population let's add three percent so seven plus three equal to seven percent what do we call the seven percent we call the seven percent the upper deviation rate so the upper deviation rate is how much we think we how much we can deviate uh, how much we think the sample size has a deviation upper deviation rate so we could have up to seven percent based on our sampling size plus the allowance risk this is the upper deviation rate now what about the tolerable deviation rate now this is important what's the tolerable deviation rate the, the tolerable deviation rate is how much we can tolerate how much we can tolerate before we say we cannot rely on this on the control so let's assume the tolerable de the tolerable deviation rate is five percent if we could we could only tolerate five then guess what then then we and in, in that in, in those circumstances we don't rely on the control because we can tolerate five and the upper deviation is seven now let's assume our up our tolerable deviation rate for this we can tolerate up to nine percent well if we can tolerate nine percent the upper deviation rate we expect it to be seven then we would rely on the control and we'll work an example later on in the session in it with numbers but this is what we're saying here so the sampling deviation rate the four percent plus the three percent the allowance for risk is equal to the upper deviation rate so we have to know the those terminology in heart and we have to know how they all interact with each other because they could give you a problem simple problem but if you don't have a basic understanding you won't be able to get it right okay the likelihood of assessing control risk too high relates to what now do you understand what does it mean assessing control risk too high assessing control risk too high it means i'm not going to re i'm not going to rely on the control because their control risk is too high the, they don't have a good internal control that's what it means the likelihood of assessing remember we assess control risk what is that going to do that that's, that's going to relate to the effectiveness of the audit or is it to the efficiency of the audit okay let's 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 walk through this logically what happen if you think the control risk is high the control risk is high you are not going to rely on their control what does that mean it means you're going to do more substantive testing it means you are in, you're going to increase your sample you're going to do more work you're going to audit more transaction you're going to do more work well what does that going to relate to if, if you assess control risk too high is, is it going to relate to the effectiveness of the control or to the efficiency of the control well if you do more work if you do more work because the control the internal uh, you think the the control risk is too high that's going to affect the efficiency of the audit it means you're doing more work maybe you don't have to do more work but it related to the efficiency now let's assume 
Why it's not effectiveness? Because if you do more work, you're going to be effective. The more work you do, the more effective you are because you're, you're looking at more samples. That's good. So it doesn't relate to your effectiveness. It relates to your efficiency. You're doing more work. Maybe you're not supposed to do more work because you, you assess the control risk too high. If you assess the control risk too high by mistake, you are less efficient. Therefore, the answer is B. You are still effective. Why? If you do more work, you're definitely effective because you're trying to catch everything you can catch. Which of the following illustrate the concept of sampling risk? So simply put, do you know what sampling risk is? That's what they're asking. Now, they can, they could, they can ask these questions in so many different ways. Let's take a look at what we, mean, what, we mean, what we mean by this question in this context. One, a randomly chosen sample may not, may not be representative of the population on a whole on a characteristic of interest. Well, look, this looks like a sampling risk definition. So I would say I will keep A. I will take out B, I will keep C, take out D. So what that, what is sampling risk? I always like to give this example because it relate as a student, it's going to relate to you very well. Uh, let's assume I have a class of 100, 100 students. I don't have classes that large, but let's assume I do have a class that, class that large. And let's assume I have 100 students and I have 10 rows. Okay, 10 rows in my class and each row will have 10 students. And here's what happened. If I ask the first row about their accounting major, what's, what's their major? I'll just ask the students to give me their major. i would ask the first row. And in this row, six out of 10 students, they say their, their major is accounting. Well, I would conclude, I will go ahead and conclude that 60%, six out of 10 is 60, 60% 60 of the students in my class, which is, let's assume this is a fine, to be more specific, let's make it a little bit more realistic. This is a financial accounting course. Financial accounting means everybody takes this course, marketing students, finance students, economics, business students, management, everyone. So if I sample the first row and I found out six out of 10 students are accounting, let's assume I also sampled the first and the second row. And in the second row, I also had six out of 10 students are accounting major. And I conclude, you know what? 60% of this class is accounting major. It's a problem. Why? I'll tell you why. Because accounting students, because that's their major, they're most likely to sit in the front, to sit in the front. Therefore, when I select it from the front, my, my, my sample is biased because most likely the, the accounting students sits in the front. So what I need to do, I need to select from all over the room, then basically make a decision based on my sampling. But if I select from the front, I could have a sampling risk. It means my randomly chosen sample may not be representative of the whole classroom because the people that sit in the front, if they're, they're more likely accounting students. Maybe they like me. That's why they sit in the front. They want to be physically close to their teachers. They want to make sure that the teacher sees them, that they're paying attention. It, it doesn't matter. The point is you got the point that there, there's a sampling risk up front. Okay, so A is definitely there. Two, an auditor may select an audit procedure that are appropriate to achieve the specific objective. Is this called a sampling risk? Now, here you are using the wrong procedure. It has nothing to do with the sampling. You know, you, you did not perform the procedure properly. It has nothing to do with whether you selected the right or the wrong sample. So two is not sampling risk. Two is you're just simply selecting the wrong procedure. Okay, so obviously the answer is A, we can take out C. Let's look at this question. And this question, it involved a lot, and I keep it for last because you have to have a good understanding of what we're doing. So let's take a look at this question. An auditor had identified a control activity that will reduce the assessment of control risk if it's operating effectively and efficiently. That's excellent. That's why we that's why we assess control risk to see if it's to see if it's working effectively and efficiently, then we can rely on the control. The auditor, the auditor has decided to perform sample for attribute. That's what you do. You sample for attribute for internal control. The auditor believed that the actual error of this activity is 2%. Okay, so let's look at this. Expected, they expect 2%. They expect the actual error to be 2%. But they can tolerate... 5%. So they expect 2, they can tolerate 5. The auditor wants to reduce sampling risk to a 10%. Now there is the sampling risk here. It means how how 
what is the chance that we are taking with this with the sampling procedures 10 percent so we can take a chance of a 10 percent that we are being wrong in this procedure so um so sampling risk is 10 percent means there's a 90 percent chance we are correct the appropriate the appropriate sample size is determined and selected so now we we sell we we selected the appropriate sample size and an error of three percent is discovered now the actual error when after we sampled the actual error was three percent remember we expected two the actual was three a chart is examined that indicate the upper deviation rate is 6.4 okay now again here we you have to understand the how we came up with the upper deviation rate the upper deviation rate is based on the sampling risk and we use tables here they're giving you the upper deviation rate the upper deviation rate equal to 6.4 percent which of the following statement is correct so we have a lot they could ask you a lot of questions about this topic let's focus on one thing at a time the allowance for sampling risk equal to 3.4 percent is this statement correct is this statement correct okay and i hope you remember from earlier that it is correct let's go back to earlier let's go back to the earlier question remember we, er, the first or the second question here we ask you about this whoops sorry okay let me clear this let me clear this so we can see this the sample deviation rate plus the allowance equal to the upper deviation rate okay what did we have in this in this in this problem in this problem we had the sampling rate of deviation which was three percent they told us the upper deviation rate from the table when we looked up the upper deviation rate from the table equal to 6.4 well the sample devi the sample rate of deviation when we sampled is three percent well this must be the plug which is 3.4 so the, the the allowance for sampling risk equal to 3.4 therefore that one is correct so the first one is correct so i'm going to keep one take out b keep c take out d so that's correct so the allowance for sampling risk is 3.4 two the auditor should determine that the control is working effectively and reduce control risk since the sample rate is three percent below the tolerable rate of five percent okay now what they're saying in number two is you sh the, the, the auditor should conclude that the that the control is working effectively and reduce the control risk since the sample rate which is the actual sample rate is three percent is below the tolerable rate of five percent is this how you make your decision is this how you make your decision and the answer is no that's not how you make your decision how do you make your decision you would look at the upper deviation rate and you compare this to the tolerable rate i can tolerate five percent but i could have 6.4 no i'm not gonna rely why because the upper deviation rate could be higher than the tolerable rate i can only tolerate five percent so we don't rely don't rely under those numbers therefore two is out so we don't determine that the control is working effectively and we're not going to reduce the internal con control we're not going to reduce the control risk therefore c is out okay if the upper deviation rate from you know from the table here from the table here was four percent then we would have accept that that number two will be correct so we would compare the upper deviation rate which is six six point four percent to the tolerable rate and therefore we don't rely i know this is a lot of information i i totally understand this there's a lot of information here that you need to absorb that's why you will need to go to my auditing course and learn about sampling from a to z from a to z with examples with practice so you have a good understanding and when you walk into the exam day sampling will be a good uh, a good question for you to get why and definitely you're going to get sampling there's no way you're not going to get sampling why because you are confident and you can show them through the answers as always i would like to remind you to like this recording subscribe check out my website if you want to add 10 to 15 points to your CPA exam, this is a long-term investment in your lifetime. Don't shortchange yourself and stay safe, especially during those coronavirus days. Good luck.